Hi, Mick McQuaid here to welcome you to ISTE 432, Database Application Development, and the lecture, Data Models and Query Languages, Part 1. And I have to warn you in advance that there's not going to be a Part 2 video because Part 2 is going to be delivered live in class. Okay, so let's get started. With the introduction, um, the source of the material is Chapter 2 of the textbook, Designing Data Intensive Applications by Martin Kleppmann. This is a really outstanding book. I'm thinking of making it the official textbook for the class, and I think it's well worth picking up in any event. And the chapter has an epigram, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Um, and I think that captures the idea that the um, limits of our uh, data model determine the, the limits of what we can think about in problems uh, that we approach with code. And the topics for this lecture are just going to be relational and document. For part two, we're going to talk about graph uh, data models as well. Data models are very important. They determine not only how we write code, but they determine how we think about the problem to solve. We layer uh, a data model on top of another data model. And for each layer of the data model, each, each data model, the key question is, how do we represent it in the next lower layer? So let me give you an example of that. And in that example, <clears throat> let me start actually at the bottom of this slide. So on the lowest level, um, hardware engineers figure out how to represent bytes in terms of electrical currents, pulses of light, magnetic fields, and more. So that is um, a, uh, an abstraction. Bytes are an abstraction over electrical currents and pulses of light and things like that. Then an abstraction over that it would be JSON or XML or relational or graph data um, that are represented in terms of bytes in memory. And those are um, created by the creator of the database software. Then you, the user of the database software, create data structures and represent them. And the, you, you, the data structures that you represent are abstractions over the basic um, fundamental building blocks of JSON, XML, or tables, or graphs. And on top of that is the abstraction of the, the real world, just thinking about the real world and modeling it in terms of objects or data structures. And data models are uh, different, and not all data models match all problems. So all data models embody some assumptions, and some uses are easy, some are hard, some are not supported by the data models, and some data transformations seem natural and some seem awkward. So it's worthwhile to learn about data models. Data model, mastering data models is hard, no question about that, um, and it's important. Uh, and you need to know enough about different models to choose the right model for an application. Uh, considering, so most of what I want to talk about is the relational model versus the document model. That's most of the rest of this part one. So SQL is the best known model based on the relational model, which was developed originally in 1970, and SQL is just the best known implementation of it. Um, so we can call it a model, but it's also an implementation of a model. <clears throat> and in that model, data is organized into relations, which are called tables. And each relation is an unordered collection of tuples, which are called rows. And many people doubted in 1970 that it could be implemented efficiently, but by the mid-80s, it became the dominant form of data representation in throughout the world. The roots of relational databases are in business data processing. So that's either transaction processing or batch processing. <coughs> and the goal of relational processing was to create an abstraction to hide implementation detail behind a cleaner interface. And there were, in the 1970s, uh, several competitors to relational databases, mainly the network model and the hierarchical model, and then in the 1980s and 90s, object databases competed with relational databases. 
And then in the early 2000s, XML databases competed with relational databases. But relational databases turned out to generalize very well, so that consequently they're used today for many purposes beyond their original scope. And you see just a few of them here. The latest competitor to relational databases is NoSQL. NoSQL was originally a hashtag for software meetups, for open source um, software solutions to database problems. And it caught on and became the name for document databases. But And, and it actually usually stands for not only SQL rather than no, you know, no, no SQL. But why is, it, why is it relevant? Why is it important? The motivators for it include the need for great scalability. So as time has passed, uh, people have outgrown many of their relational databases. Uh, there's a widespread interest in free and open source software. So as time has passed, people became frustrated with Oracle, which is the primary implementation of uh, relational database management software and which is proprietary. Um, and people wanted to do specialized query operations that were not supported by the relational model, and I'll get to those in a minute. And, and people were just generally frustrated with the restrictions of relational schemas, so people wanted to be able to do things like add a key and value um, to an existing database. But it's unlikely that NoSQL will simply replace relational databases. In fact, it's most, more likely that they'll peacefully coexist, or not, as, not necessarily peacefully, but at least coexist. And this concept is called polyglot persistence. Um, now, a, a big problem, a big motivator for not only NoSQL, but other... Um, uh, other ways of, of storing data is that there's a there's a mismatch between the storage of relational data and object oriented code um, and that mismatch has come to be called the impedance mismatch the object relational impedance mismatch and it's analogous to the impedance mismatch in electronics between components of different resistances and there have arisen solutions to this that I don't want you to use in this class they're not very good uh, in my view, uh, and what they do is hide the database as much as possible. And this is a database class, so I don't want you to hide the database as much as possible. Um, and they don't totally hide the differences between the models. So you should be aware of this mismatch. Now let's use an example to um, talk about object about a, a relational model versus the document model. Um, so in this um, example of a resume, or actually it's going to be a LinkedIn profile, uh, we're going to have some fields that appear just once. So one, one person has one first name and one last name. But there may be several jobs on a person's resume. There may be several educational institutions on a person's resume. There may be several different forms of contact on the person's resume. So how do we manage that? Well, in a database, we would normalize the relations. We would put the positions, the education, and the contact info into separate tables. If we're using XML or JSON for that matter, <clears throat> we would use a hierarchical document. Here's the relational version of a LinkedIn profile, and it uses keys to connect the tables. So we have a key uh, under user ID, and that, uh, that key appears as a foreign key in a positions table, an education table, and a contact info table. By the way, there's, I think, a mistake in this particular uh, diagram, which is that, that and a, a relational mistake. Um, industry ID should not be in the user's table. Uh, there should be a separate associative table that has user ID and, and industry ID, and then a separate industries table with a list of industries. And the way that you can see that here is that the uh, the person has two positions and they're in two different industries. So this person is in philanthropy and they're also in software. So they should have two industry entries and we don't want two industry entries in the users table. So we want to partition that out into a separate table. Here's a JSON representation of the same thing. 
and unfortunately I cut it off here and I and I omitted part of it but g the general idea is that you have some individual elements and then you have some arrays of elements so JSON reduces that impedance mismatch that I mentioned between the application and storage but there are still problems that we'll discuss later but we want to discuss one advantage right now which is that JSON has better locality so all the all the information in the resume is in one document so we don't need a multi-way join to fetch the entire profile so let's say that we're displaying suppose we're linked in and we're displaying this profile and that mainly what we do is display profiles it makes more sense to store all the profile data together rather than have to uh, do a multi-way join every time that we want to display a profile so JSON um, makes that possible JSON also makes the tree structure of the data explicit. So the data in a resume is tree structured. And here's an example of, a, of that um, diagrammed as a tree. So the root is the user. And there are some individual elements at the first level and some arrays of elements at the first level. And so those uh, array elements may have further array elements. So notice that region ID and industry ID were um, used instead of just directly using Greater Seattle Area and Philanthropy as the um, region name and the industry name. What are the advantages of standardized lists and letting users choose from autocompleters or dropdowns? Well, that should be pretty obvious. That, that's hopefully something that you have brought with you from other database classes that you want to have consistent style and spelling across profiles. You want to avoid ambiguity. For example, there might be more than one city named Seattle, um, and we want to give different IDs to, to those two cities. Um, it's easier to update. You know, a, a city name might change due to political events. This has happened um, se several times with major cities in uh, different countries. And we, we would only have to change the city name in one place and leave the city's ID uh, alone in other places. And better localization support. So if we want to translate Greater Seattle Area into French or German or Spanish, um, we only have to translate it in one place. And better search so we can encode the relationships of IDs uh, easily. We can encode, we can say that, you know, one ID is a specific object and another ID is a parent object. Um, and there are other, oh, other advantages of IDs. So, for example, IDs don't have meanings to humans, so we don't need to change them. We have to change names. When, when a person changes their names, we need to change uh, all occurrences of their name, but we don't need to change all occurrences of their ID. It's just a meaningless number. Um, and it's less expensive to duplicate IDs in the long run. And this is a key idea of normalization, removing any duplicates that may need to be updated. That's a, that's a central idea in normalization. Um, but many-to-one relationships don't fit well with the document model. So support for joins is actually often non-existent in document databases, or weak at best. And document databases resist modification. So it's um, <coughs> it's not easy to uh, do things like changing the database so that uh, we maintain a separate table about an organization rather than maintaining all the information about the organization in the resume document. It also resists modification if we wanted to, for example, add a recommender system to the resume data store which, for which we would need additional tables. So here's an example in the LinkedIn profile where you see if you hover over an organization's name, information from another table pops up that um, identifies the organization as an entity rather than just as a string. And we might want to use many-to-many -many relationships. So, for example, we have multiple users. So the dashed lines here are around um, users and... Um, we have um, two users here and some elements that they have in common, schools and organizations that they have in common, 
and then we have links between them as for recommendations. So <clears throat> one problem that's often, or one question that's often raised about document databases is that they're repeating history because they look suspiciously like the hierarchical databases of the 1970s. So back actually in the 1960s, the IBM Corporation created a, uh, a database, oops, not a database, a database called the Information Management System or IMS for the Apollo Space Program. And they released it publicly in the 1970s and it became the most popular database of that, of that era. And it was very much like JSON. It represented trees of nested records. And it had a problem, which was that it required that you either duplicate uh, information or you do manual resolution of references between um, records that have this you know that have duplicate information so that required a lot of code or a lot of duplication of data and that also required a lot of code so the hierarchical model was superseded in the 1970s um, and relational databases and network databases competed for a while um, relational databases uh, became the, the uh, dominant paradigm, but uh, network databases are still worth knowing something about. So partly just so you don't repeat history. So the network model is just like the hierarchical model, except that every record could have multiple parents instead of one parent. So uh, if you imagine a tree that has the you know the root can extend so well an example is given right here you have one record for seattle and link it to everyone living there so seattle is in a sense a parent for those living there but on the other hand you could have other parents so you could have the names of the corporations where they worked as parents for the same people for the same records so you would have access paths to the all these records links long chains of links between records that were like pointers in a programming language and so you would you would write code that would follow linked lists of of uh, chains of of links and it was just like linked lists except that many lists might lead to the same record which added a lot of complication for programmers it was very difficult for programmers to handle but it was very efficient on slow hardware. But because it was inflexible, it never it uh, was a little bit popular for a while, but then kind of died out because you had to write a lot of code for every little task. Um, and in the relational model, um, the data is exposed really simply in rows and columns. It's actually stored in trees, but it but what you see is rows and columns. And the query optimizer decides the order of query processing and index use. So you do very little programming. You just write out declaratively in SQL what you want from the database, and the query optimizer figures out how to get it. So the order of processing and the indexes are, un are like the query path, but this access path is traversed automatically. Its complexity is completely hidden from you. So um, that's a layer of abstraction over the way that that relational databases are stored, which is generally in B trees, which are not the same thing as binary trees, by the way. If you haven't taken data structures classes yet, um, you, you may confuse those. B tree is a completely separate data structure. It's very uh, efficient for uh, doing updates. Anyway, a key insight of the relational model is that the query optimizer only needs to be built once for a particular relational database, and then all applications that use it can benefit. So document databases haven't followed that. Document databases follow the hierarchical model in the sense that they store nested records within the parent. And document databases are similar to relational databases in that they use document references, kind of like foreign keys in the relational model. Now, there are a lot of differences between relational and document databases, but I only want to focus on the differences in the data models here. So document databases have some great advantages. Schema flexibility, which I'll say more about. Better performance due to locality, I already mentioned that. Um, 
and that's only better performance when locality matters. Uh, some applications are better represented by a document than by tables. So, for example, a, a web page is frequently more um, appropriately modeled as a document than as a series of tables. Relational databases have advantages. They're better support for joins, better support for many-to-one relationships, and better support for many-to-many -many relationships, breaking up many-to-many -many relationships using associative tables. So the question that you should be asking yourself is which application or which model gives sim simpler application code? And the answer is it depends. Um, in some cases one does, in some cases the other one does. So if you have a tree of one-to-many relations where the entire tree is loaded at once, you definitely prefer the document model. That's going to give simpler code. If the data uses many-to-many -many relationships, then the relational model is probably going to give you simpler application code. If the data is highly interconnected, then relational databases are better than document databases, but graph databases will turn out to dominate both. Schema flexibility in the document model. So um, document databases enforce no schema. Um, the arbitrary keys and values can be added to the document. So taking the resume example uh, one step further, we could say that after a while you, you process a bunch of resumes and then you get one that has hobbies. Well, you can just add the key hobby and the value of that hobby into that document without worrying about the fact that it doesn't exist in other documents. However, that means that there are no guarantees for the reader that a field exists. Now, it's not completely fair to say that um, document databases are schemaless because all code assumes some structure when reading. So uh, the code has to, has to have a lot of conditional statements that, exp that um, deal with the problem of uh, varying records, variant records. Uh, so instead of calling them schemaless, we can call document databases schema on read and um, say that the structure of the data is implicit. It's only interpreted when we read, so it's only, it only needs to be in the code. The relational databases, on the other hand, we could call schema on write um, because the structure of data is explicit and the schema is enforced by the database so that all written data conforms to the schema. Here are examples of dealing with this. The top one is an example of dealing with it in a document database, and the bottom one is an example of dealing with it in a couple of relational databases. So in the top one, we see some uh, JavaScript to deal with the fact that we've split. So let's say in the resume example, we have um, up until December 8th, 2013, we've been encoding name as one field. And after December 8th, 2013, we decide we're going to encode name as two fields, first name and last name, or first name and name. So um, we have to write a piece of code here that every time that we encounter uh, a, one that doesn't have first name, that is a, a document written before December 8th, 2013, we have to split it on space in the, in the name and and uh, split off the first name and put it into a first name uh, key. Now the same task would be accomplished differently in a relational database. We would migrate in a relational database. So that would happen in two steps. There would first would be an alter table. So we would add the column first name and then we would update. And there are two examples given here, one for Postgres and one for MySQL. Um, the only difference is that one of them uses a split part function and the other one uses a substring index function. But it's the same thing. Basically, um, we update all of the um, we update all of the records in this migration. Now, we don't actually have to do that, um, and I'll show you a reason why here. So most databases, execute the alter statement in milliseconds except for MySQL. Um, 
which copies the entire table and can take a really long time. But most databases can, can deal with alter. But update is slow on all relational databases. So what you can do is fill in the new field at read time, which is what a document database would do. So the next time that you read that record, you, um, you do the update table. Okay, so there are advantages to the schema on read approach. If you have many types of objects and it's not practical to put them into separate tables, that's an advantage for the schema on read approach. If you have external systems that you have no control over and that may change at any time and, that, and they determine the data structure, which this often happens in channels in um, corporate America where you have a channel captain who sort of determines what, what um, other competitors in the channel do and the channel captain often determines the data format and, so, and may change the data format at any time. So Walmart is an example of a channel captain. All their suppliers have to go along with whatever changes in data structures that they make because you have to be able to interoperate with their systems. And in these kinds of situations, schemas just get in the way, but they're helpful in others. Storage locality. So if you typically um, access an entire document, it makes sense to store it together. But if you only use small parts of it, it's wasteful to use a document database, which has to retrieve the whole thing to use part of it. Uh, also on a document database, on updates, the entire document usually needs to be rewritten. So if you have to do a lot of updates, that kind of speaks against the uh, storage locality. So the guidance for document databases is to keep the documents small if you can, but that kind of limits the use cases for documents. Um, and relational databases have some locality. So there is, for example, a, a database by Google called Spanner that allows a table's rows to be interleaved with a parent table. So that provides locality. Oracle does the same thing, although they have a more cumbersome name for it. They call it multi-table index cluster tables, whatever that means. <clears throat> And there are a couple of wide column databases that do the same thing, Cassandra and HBase, that uh, use column families. So uh, what the author of this book claims, and I, I think I see happening too, is that relational and document databases to some extent are converging. So relational databases have supported XML for a long time. They're uh, increasingly supporting JSON and document databases are increasingly supporting join-like actions. So they're becoming more similar. So that's the end of part one. Uh, and as I said before, part two is going to be a live in-class lecture. So thank you for your attention and hope to see you in lecture.